Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, those of you who are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary and those of you who are worshiping with us online. If you would take a moment and fill out our friendship pad, record your presence, pass it along the pew, pass it back. Make sure that you know the names of the people beside you or right in front of you or behind you. We can actually share a pad between two two pews if you want to do it that way. And those of you who are online, if you'll just put your name in the chat and say hello, let us know where you are. Uh, we would love to know that you're there. I call your attention to uh, the announcements that are in the bulletin about the activities of the church. Um, this week is a busy week. Um, this is the monthly Tuesday morning Bible study, focusing this year on sacred encounters. And even if you've never been before, if God is calling you to study His Word, please consider attending this Bible study or one of our two Sunday classes. Today is World Communion Sunday. That's an ecumenical Christian day that was started in the 1940s to bring Christians together across the globe. So take a, mat take a moment to imagine Christians across the world taking communion together today. We come to the table today with our siblings in every time and place, and we celebrate the peace that we find and, and commit to building a more just and peaceful world. This is also the 40th anniversary of the PCUSA's Peacemaking Initiative. I love the name of it, Peacemaking, The Believer's Calling. I want to thank Janine Davison for her vision with this beautiful table uh, arrangement and a selection of international breads. Back in the spring on World Ocean Day, one of our Sunday classes was studying the environmental impacts on our world oceans, from which arose a conversa conversation about single-use plastics. They put together a careful proposal now approved by the session. And today, I'm so excited to announce that we begin a new practice of reducing single-use plastics for communion with glass cups. Many, many thanks to the memorial team for supporting the purchase of the cups and to the worship team for purchasing dishwasher racks and to Joseph, our beautiful sexton, who has enthusiastically supported this uh, project. The fellowship team is also considering ways to reduce single-use plastics for fellowship activities. Today we're also beginning a, or reviving a, a former um, activity in our church, and that is we have the, the capability now for home communion. We have elements that will be on the table, be blessed today, and we have a, a, a faithful team of folks who are willing to go out and give home communion. If you know of someone who is wanting home communion, be sure and let uh, someone know about that um, today and going forward. The peace of Christ. On this World Communion Sunday, we celebrate that Christ's peace extends throughout creation. Wherever the church gathers for worship, we are assured of Christ's peace. We celebrate that we are connected, we are loved, and we are not alone. We worship together and are fed from Scripture and at Christ's table of peace. Extending the peace of Christ is part of an active, engaged faith. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I forgot to make all those announcements about other things happening today. We'll do that right before I start the call to worship. Okay.
our pastor nominating committee is hard at work and first taking care to understand what this church wants for the future of this church and our pastor. And today, after worship, is a visioning meeting. We invite all of you to attend. There will be food, pizza, cake. Uh, we want to hear, the pastor nominating committee wants to hear from you what you want for the future of this church. They will be meeting in the fellowship hall. Let's join in the call to worship. We gather from the west to the east, from the south to the north. The Lord is our hope. Our trust is in God. God brought us out of bondage and made us free. The Lord is our hope. Our trust is in God. The deeds of God are amazing and mighty. The Lord is our hope. Our trust is in our God. God of the universe, we come together today to worship you and to be the church together, praising you, learning, giving, celebrating, and loving. We come in awe that Jesus called two fishermen, then ten others, then sat at table, this is for you, and charging them to go out into the world. And now, over 2,000 years later, we are among the over two and a half billion Christians around the world sharing the sacrament together on our World Communion Day. Blessed are the saints who came before us to make this possible. Amen. I invite you to stand for the singing of our first hymn, number 339, Be Thou My Vision. be seated. At this time in our worship, we offer confessions as we were taught to do, together and privately. When we offer God our confession, we join the beautiful work of peace and reconciliation, first with God and then with others. Trusting in God, let us make our confessions together. Almighty God, we have been wandering in the wilderness of sin. We have complained in the face of your mercy. We have been selfish and conceited in the face of your sacrifice. We have not done your will. Teach us humility. Teach us gratitude. Infuse your spirit into our beings so that we might be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, 
Amen. Friends in Christ, know this good news. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and here in this place and time, we are reminded of this amazing grace. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. came from God, and now is the time to consider giving back to God to further His kingdom. One major initiative of the PCUSA Peacemaking Initiative is the Peace and Global Witness Offering. By participating in this offering, we can extend Christ's peace throughout our community and our world. There are, I don't know if the flyer is in the bulletin today. It was in last week's bulletin. There's several drifting around. There's a flyer that tells you more about this. You can search out global, um, Peace and Global Witness Offering to learn more about this. Um, the thing about this offering is that when you give, a portion of that gift is marked specifically for uh, First Presbyterian Church. We retain a portion of each gift for our local initiatives, especially our amazing outreach grants program. So a quarter of it stays with our local congregation, a quarter of it goes to uh, peacemaking initiatives through our regional Senate of the Sun, and 50% of the offering goes to the awesome work for peace and reconciliation being done by the Presbyterians across the globe. Today is not the only day you can give. You can give any day. Uh, particularly this month, but you can give all year. You can even set up a regular gift giving uh, through their um, through the uh, offering the website that you can find. So I invite you to prayerfully consider your giving to this initiative. I invite the ushers forward.
God of all our gifts, we return today a portion of what you have given us. We bring our gifts before you in humility, aware of all you have provided, aware of our own stinginess, even when trying to be generous. We pray for wisdom for those who make decision about how these gifts will be used to further your kingdom on earth, both here at First Church and in the community. We pray for those who have committed to furthering the work of the church and for those still pondering in their hearts how best to give their time and talents. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first lesson today, excuse me, <clears throat> our first lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew about the questions of the Pharisees and the questions to the Pharisees. The authority of Jesus questioned and the parable of the two sons. I read from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority do you, are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus continued saying to the Pharisees, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. But later, he changed his mind, and he went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? The Pharisees said, The first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, now, as we prepare for communion with siblings across the globe, I invite you to stand for the singing of our second hymn. While you're doing that, I want you to notice that Connie Campbell is going to get up and walk out, as she often does on Sundays. And I want you to know, I want you to thank her, because I want you to know that she brings the Word of God even to our tiniest members in the nursery. And we thank you. Let's join in singing 513. Let us break bread together.
be seated. Oh God, we ask once again that you would speak to us clearly from your word. A word that doesn't change, but sometimes the letters change. The meaning is there. And we pray that your spirit, which is in us, would hear your truth and the words we need to hear to know you, to remember you, and to know that we are linked with Christians all over the world, all gifted, all called, all given the same spirit. We pray, Lord, you would help us know that, that we are to have the mind of Christ. Therefore, we must spend time listening and understanding your voice as it comes through Scripture as it speaks in our daily lives. This we ask in your name. Amen. The epistle lesson comes from Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi saying, If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection, and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Thanks be to God. Amen. The sermon title is Authority, How Important Is It? And I'm going to try and wed the, the, the two, the gospel and the epistle together. Authority is important. It's really important. You want to go to a doctor that has certification who has earned the degree. You don't want to go to someone who played a doctor on TV, right? Authority is important. We Presbyterians, PCUSA, believe in an educated clergy. So before I could come before you or anybody else who wears this robe and has the Masters of Divinity, has to go through school, get educated, be examined by the presbytery, have a committee that looks at you and says, no, you need to do this. You're not quite ready. One of the things I'll, I'll never forget is when I was, as they say at that time, under care of presbytery, every year we had to come and be examined and they would look at grades and who we were and they would say, 
well done or you know we'd like you to work a little bit more on this or that he never knew what would happen and I remember when I was in my end of my second year there was a meeting and there was this one lady she had just finished her degree so after college after seminary after three years and she might have even done an internship I don't remember so that would have been four years the committee said to her we don't think you're quite ready. We don't think you're mature enough to go into a church and lead a church. And I always thought, how can you say that to somebody? We don't make a whole lot of money. And after all this education, you're saying to her, she's not ready. Now you tell her, you know, you should have done this before. You need to work on this or that. But they had the power. So before they gave her the authority to come into a church, they wanted to make sure she was mature enough to lead a wonderful congregation, people like you. And at the time, I thought, oh, that's so unfair. I still have a bit of that in me. At the same time, better that a group of people who really knows an individual who wants to be a pastor of a church says to them, you're not ready. That had to have been hard to do. But it was in their mind. I have no idea what happened to her after that. She, uh, she had to do. She had to grow. She had to figure out what they meant. And hopefully they made that clear. So that when she was ready, she would come. And you all could trust her and her leadership. Because once you are given the authority, right, there she is. So given the authority is really important. You know, you need to trust Presbytery that the seminaries, that the pastors before you have had an education, so they kind of know what they're talking about. You know, they know hopefully a little bit more than you in certain areas, and you can trust that. So by what authority? So now we have in the scripture, the Pharisees saying to Jesus, by what authority do you have? Now Jesus knew this was a difficult question because the Pharisees are coming from the long tradition that their authority comes from Moses and has been handed down from generation to generation to generation. And they knew that Jesus wasn't in that tradition that they were in. Jesus had the following of many people. And he was doing these miracles, these great mighty acts of God. By what authority, Jesus, are you doing this? And they've already had the answer in their head, right? So we call that a closed question. Jesus, in true rabbinic style, Ask them a question. Sure, I'll tell you. But first, you have to tell me. What authority did John the Baptist have? Oh, he had to say John the Baptist. Because the people love John the Baptist. Out there in the desert, speaking the truth, calling people to repentance, baptizing them. By what authority did he have? Well, God called him. He was doing what God called him to do. He wasn't a Pharisee. But the people loved John the Baptist. And the powers that be, Herod, had him killed because he went up against Herod and spoke the truth. So by what authority did Jesus have? The same authority that John the Baptist had. But they couldn't say that. So they were le left with, I don't know. I don't know. Yet you and I, we have to answer the same question. Did Jesus have the authority to do what he did? And of course, we're here today to say, well, duh, Steve, of course he did. It came from God. We're all in agreement with that. It's easy for us now. We have the Gospels, we have the Epistles, we have the testimony of generation after generation. It's easy for us because now, like the Pharisees, we have the tradition. 
What's harder for us is to recognize if somebody in the front row, somebody who hasn't got the masters of divinity, has the authority to do what they do. And yet, the wisdom of Scripture is right there. God speaks to you. God calls you, us, to do things, right? In the, the epistle, it, it's quite clear that Paul is saying God is out there and God is inside us. Have the same mind of Christ. That mind isn't just out here in a, a book. That same mind is within us. And so by what authority do we do things? Well, we believe God called us to do this. The other thing about us Christians and other religious people, we see life in a different way. Salvation, the good news. You know, it's an old word and it comes when, well, the emperor's birthday was good news. They were saved. Why? What was so good about it? Because he would cut taxes on that day. He would give food to the poor on that day. So it was good news. Good news, your salvation came from the emperor in that way. But of course, as the gospels use it, that good news is from Christ. And Christ has saved us in the same way today. You know, the ancient Israelites use salvation as save from famine, save from hurricanes. That's us. Save from war. Of course, illness. Whatever that could be out there that could harm you. It was, salvation was here and now. It was for us. And so, the good news is for us today as well as eternally. The Spirit of God and the authority which we have is out there and it is in here. We see God moving in a very deep way. I was thinking of, of a doctor. A doctor gives us medicine and our bodies get better if it's the right medicine, right? But sometimes that medicine doesn't work in someone. Our bodies are designed to heal themselves if we get the right stuff and we treat it well, we get better. But then where did the doctor get the information to know that this was the right medicine? Through education. But really, was it the doctor? I mean, in a Christian perspective, God was working in that individual to give them the gifts, the ability to think and to know, to know and to do. And of course, they had the authority once they passed all the tests, right? And all the experimentation. But where did that drug come from? It came from somebody who had the desire to do the research, the experiments, and to see what this does and how it can make a difference. And where does that come from? You see what I'm doing? You just keep, it's layer upon layer of how God has created us, given us abilities. We Christians believe that God is within us. God has given us gifts to use, and it makes a difference. The other thing about the writing of Scripture, which is really interesting, is that work out your salvation, the good news, with fear and trembling. Where does that come from? Well, the writers in the New Testament, they knew that the people knew the stories of the Old Testament. Where is their fear and trembling? Going back to Moses, he's up in Mount Sinai, Thunder, lightning, what's going on up there? And down comes Moses. The Ten Commandments. This is the Word of God being in the presence of God. It is to elicit fear and trembling. 
work out our salvation with fear and trembling? I think part of that is recognizing that God works through other people and not just me. God works, okay, on world communion. God works in all our different denominations. Even though they talk different, even though they do things different, God is working in all of us. And we can be of the same mind. What mind is that? Holland is one of the happiest nations on earth. And in the study that I read, they have a particular attitude. And the attitude is, they think of other people as better than themselves. Whoa, we heard that this morning, didn't we? Yeah, in Philippians. They put into practice that which we know and have had, thinking of others as better. Servant leadership, as was Jesus, which is what we are called to do. I could preach more. I have lots of really cool stuff. I think what's important for us today is to see God on the outside, the world. God is in working through lots of people in a lot of different ways. And the good news for us is today to realize what we have been saved from, war, famine, hurricanes, whatever it might be, to give thanks to God. And also in humility to keep listening for others who also have the mind of Christ and that we would be unified to listen first, to seek to understand each other, even though we might worship a bit different, to see that, to see that spirit flowing between us and all around, even though we use different breads, speak different languages. The hymn this morning, the first one was an Irish tune. The second one was an African tune. You know, we have so many gifts to give and to share. And we are so blessed because they have done that. So enriched. So may we continue the gift. May we continue the giving. Because I know truly you are better than I am. But together, we are so strong, and the good news lives within us for the glory of God and others. Amen. The table before us is another gift from God. People who we don't know have made the bread. Janine bought it made it. Thank you, Janine. The worship committee has designed it. We, we thank them. The bottom line is, this is the Lord's table. The Lord has created this and used us. The symbol of the cross is also before us. We're ever aware of Christ's sacrifice. But as the Lord's table, the invitation is from the Lord to you to partake of the grace which our Lord gives, the good news, the good news. You know, there, there's a, a phrase in, in language where we say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work comes from a word that we use for energize. You could say, Energize what you do. What you do should have energy. It isn't out of guilt. It isn't out of that fear of guilt. It's out of the energy that we get from God. And feeling that energizing energy, right? What energizes us is the Spirit of God. Grace energizes us to know God and to do God's will all over the world. It is the same Spirit. It is the same voice of God inviting us to partake of God's grace. What a joy and privilege it is for me and for others to proclaim that and to live it out with you 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O holy and wonderful God, you have called us here. You have worked in our lives to help us know you, to be unified, to love you, and to love others, to be grateful, and to share that energy, those gifts with others, because they too are worthy. Oh, holy God, we also praise you for your son, Jesus, who has shared our weaknesses, was tempted in ways that we are, and he obeyed you even by suffering and dying for us. But you have also raised him to rule the world and given him a name above every name, Lord and Christ. So we praise him and we glorify you, great God, parent to us all on this World Communion Sunday. We say the prayer in many languages, but we all say it. Please join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are story people, and we're always called to remember. And so this day we do remember our Lord Jesus Christ calling his disciples together, and surely there were women there too, men and women together. Disciples were there. It was probably the women that got the, you know, the table together, just as a woman has prepared this. Servanthood, leadership. But he was greatly distraught that night because he knew what would happen. And as they were going through the Passover, Jesus took the bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this, this is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do this remembering me. So this day we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, it is we, the whole world is remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. And in humility, we realize that same spirit has been given to us and connects us with each other all over the world. That even though we're different, our diversity makes us strong. And in our humility, we're always listening for the voice of Christ speaking through others. I would ask that the choir come first, and we will give them the bread and the cup. And then after they have been served, then we'll serve the congregation. love for you. The sign of the new covenant. God's love for you. The sign of the new covenant. God's love for you. The sign of the new covenant. God's love for you. The sign of the new covenant.
sign of the new covenant for you, Andrew. Sign of the new covenant for you, Courtney. Assert it. Sign of the new covenant. love for you. Thank you. Sign of the new covenant. God's love for you. Sign of the new covenant. God's love for you. Sign of the new covenant. God's love for you.
And so, God, for this small meal that reminds us of how connected we are, different kinds of bread, different kinds of people, but united in finding their nourishment in you. We pray that truly we would be united and have the same mind that was in Christ. In your name we pray and truly give thanks. Amen. Let us now turn to hymn number 372, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Lord, I want to be more humble. Have you ever heard the song, It's Hard to Be Humble by Mac Davis? It says, now here I am, heading at one of the biggest nightclubs in the country, and I wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning in this star suite all by myself. Oh, that's what I said, oh, but I did what I've always done to cheer myself up. I picked up my guitar. I sat down and wrote me a little song. Now, this is how it feels to be alone at the top of the hill and trying to figure out why. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To, mo to know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. And on he goes, but it's such a sad story. When we think how great we are and not realizing we are only made great by the Holy Spirit that is within us. And the knowledge that it isn't as much me as it is God working through me and all of you and everybody that's gone before us so I could do what I do. And of course, perfect in every way. <laughs> what a joke that is, right? But what a gift it is to be humble, to be more like Jesus. 
Let us work out our salvation, the good news, knowing where it comes from, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in that humility, seeing others and how we can use that God-given energy to build them up in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.